number 10 spot, we have a plastic bag. It is unfortunately no surprise that on one of the deepest dives we as humans have ever been able to accomplish, along with all of the amazing new creatures and never been explored places, there would be none other than a plastic bag. In 2019, Victor Vescovo took a dive into the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest part of the Mariana Trench, which is an unbelievable feat and not an easy task, and he was rewarded by being reminded of human trash. Despite that little finding, Victor broke the record for deepest dive, which is of course amazing for scientific advancements and research. Every time someone manages to do these things that once seemed impossible, we get closer to revealing more of our ocean's mysteries that lay at the deepest points on Earth, which is very, very cool. While it would be amazing if the dives weren't plagued with plastic pollution, at least they were able to also discover a bunch of new crustaceans and give us all a little look into what life looks like in the Mariana Trench. At number nine, we have the Dumbo Octopus. It's an octopus whose favorite Disney movie is Dumbo. <laughs> just kidding, that would just be weird. Almost as weird as the real Dumbo Octopus. Although, that is how it got its name, because it looks like Dumbo. Anyway, 9,800 meters below the surface and found deep in the Marianas Trench, you can find these dopey, kinda cute looking creatures. These creatures go from eight to 12 inches and swim using their ears. Seems cute and friendly enough, right? Well, surprising for all of us, the Dumbo octopus is actually a predator and can swallow its meals all in one gulp. These kind of octopi also fall under the category of umbrella octopuses because they have webbed tentacles, giving them an umbrella-like shape. Almost like a starfish, but with a massive balloon on its head. Luckily, we're all too big for this dopey looking octopus to feed on us, so if you want to go for a swim and see some, you don't have to worry about them eating you. But I can't guarantee that the other deep sea creatures won't be as small. In our number eight spot today, we have comb jellies. Comb jellies are gelatinous creatures that are named for their unique plates of fused cilia, which are called combs. These combs help the jelly move through the water like boat oars, and while other microscopic organisms also have this sort of mechanism, comb jellies are the largest animal with this feature. These combs are also part of the reason that comb jellies are so gorgeous to look at. Rather than bioluminescence, the rainbow light effect that can sometimes be seen on them is from light diffracting off of the combs in all different directions. Many comb jellies have one pair of tentacles, although they appear to have multiple, but that is just caused by their tentacles branching out. I'm saying the word tentacles. <laughs> these tentacles are used to help them hunt like a sort of fishing line. Aside from this, these jellies don't sting, which is always a good thing. Not that I'm planning on heading into the deep sea anytime soon. In terms of today's list, I'd say these guys are one of the less creepy creatures we've got going on today. At number seven, we have the deep sea hatchet fish. It got its name because, well, it looks like a silvery swimming hatchet. There are over 40 species of hatchet fish and they can be found at the depths of 5,000 feet. That's just over 1,500 meters. This fish may be tiny, but it does not look that friendly nor welcoming. The deep sea hatchet fish can grow between 2.8 to 12 centimeters long. So while their size and appearance may not be enough to fend off predators, these deep sea fish have evolved to form an ingenious camouflaging technique. They are also like a lot of other deep sea fish because their bodies are bioluminescent meaning they create their own light and can glow in the dark. Their light shines from their stomachs, but no, they do not have any Care Bear powers in case you were wondering. Revealing a silhouette can be dangerous in the deep ocean because of predators, but luckily for the hatchet fish, it can control its light to match the same light in the water. That's the super cool camouflage technique I was talking about. Man, that could be useful. In our number six spot today, we have the anglerfish. If you've seen Finding Nemo, you might recognize these guys. This bony fish is known for its luminescent horn that is used to lure other fish as prey. There are different kinds of angler fish, but those who live in the deep sea are referred to as sea devils, which truly does feel fitting. The females are much larger than the males and can reach up to almost four feet, while the males can reach up to five and a half inches, but these little sea devils are able to eat prey up to the same size as itself. That's crazy. Luckily, most anglerfish remain so deep in the ocean that they are not a threat to humans. And even if they did live not quite so deep in the ocean, most humans would just be too big for them to even try to attack. That sure doesn't mean they aren't crazy to look at though. Just to add a little more about how strange these guys are though, these fish reproduce when the male fuses into the female and lives off of her resources until it can produce sperm. 
That sounds like a nightmare. Coming in at our halfway point at number five, we have the frilled shark. As if you weren't terrified enough of sharks, this one looks just as terrifying. Although, now that I see more pictures of it, I can't really take it seriously because it just reminds me of Jerry Seinfeld in the frilly shirt. Anyone else remember that episode? Sorry, Jerry Bear, the shark wore it better. The frilled shark got its name for its six to seven frilled gills on the side of its snake-like body. But that's not the creepiest part of this shark. The frilled shark has a set of 300 razor sharp teeth. They can grow up to six feet in size, which is 1.8 meters. Even though this was one of the first deep sea animals to be discovered in the 19th century, it's not the easiest to find. These sharks swim at depths of 16,000 feet, which is around 5,000 meters. However, it is extremely difficult for scientists to study this deep sea creature. They swim at such deep levels that when brought to the surface, they practically die immediately. Due to those reasons, there isn't much known about the habits and life cycles of these sharks, but maybe this is just one of those things that is better left unknown. In our number four spot today, we have the ping pong tree sponge. Doesn't this name sound so cute and sweet, like something you'd want as a little pet? Well, thank you, Dad. These little things are not what their sweet name would suggest. The name, of course, comes from their appearance as they quite literally look like a little tree that's growing ping pong balls, but those little ping pong balls are where it all starts. The ping pongs have tiny little hook-like extensions that are there to trap any kind of prey that gets too close. From there, the sponge slowly consumes its prey while still alive. This may not be the most vicious creature in all of the deep sea, but it is proof that looks can be very deceiving. Would you have thought that this little thing would be a carnivorous creature? It honestly was a little surprising to me personally. Starting us off in our top three, at number three, we have the goblin shark. This shark might just be the creepiest thing on this list. I don't know about you, Olivia, but how did these guys get their names? Well, let's all take a look at the massive goblin-like nose on the front of its face. Yeah, that's how it's got its name. That's how it got its name. It's not really a pretty thing to look at, but at these depths, I don't think there's many people or other fish to impress. These sharks also aren't the usual grayish color. They are instead more of a pink. Not only do these things look absolutely crazy, they are also crazy in size. Goblin sharks can reach lengths up to 18 feet. That's 5.5 meters. You probably won't be swimming near any of them anytime soon anyway though, because they live at depths of 3,000 feet. That's about 915 meters. And the older they get, the deeper they dive. A shark that intentionally swims to its grave. How cute. Same as the filled shark, not much is known about these creatures. They're almost as mysterious and sought after as real goblins. For all we know, goblins are real, and when they get dropped in water, they morph into these crazy looking sharks and keep their distance from the rest of the world. <laughs> I buy it. In our number two spot today, we have the deep sea dragonfish. These guys are a pretty strong contender for the strangest looking animal on this list. These predatory fish use their fang-like teeth to grab onto their prey in the dark, cold, deep sea environment. They have no scales and instead have slippery eel-like skin, which only adds to their creepiness level. Similar to the anglerfish, these guys have a little lighted barbel that hangs from its lower jaw to attract its prey towards it. These fish really use bioluminescence to their advantage, but they also have another, less common ability. Firstly, since many of their prey are also bioluminescent, they have a special stomach that will ensure the light cannot be seen from inside of their stomach so as to not give away their position. Secondly, they are able to produce a red glow. This glow is thought to perhaps be used to signal other dragonfish, but it is definitely used by them to illuminate and detect their prey. They are the only known fish that has the ability to both produce and see red light, as most fish can only see more of a blue light. So while these guys are definitely very creepy to look at, they're also pretty interesting and very talented. And finally, coming in at our number one spot and our weirdest thing found in the Marianas Trench is the zombie worm, aka the bone worm, also also known as the Osidax, but I like zombie worm best. These worms live at the very bottom of the Marianas Trench and the very bottom of the ocean and feed off of bones of dead animals, such as whales. The zombie worm secretes acid to help access the inner contents of the dead bones and it then uses symbiotic bacteria to convert the bones proteins and fats into nutrients that it then uses as food. The feathery branches on the worm wiggle in the water and they pull in oxygen to keep itself alive. 
Females grow up to two inches in length, while males are microscopic in size. Sorry, boys. Females will collect a harem of males on their body, and then the males will find their way into the female oviducts. The female then releases her fertilized eggs into the water, and the worm's life cycle begins again. That is about all we know about these little ones, because they live at such deep depths of our ocean. So until us humans find ways to explore the depths of the Marianas Trench, we will just have to make do with what we got. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have plastic crustaceans. A few years ago, there were little shrimp-like creatures that were found 2,000 feet deep in the ocean, and of course, none other than the Mariana Trench. The little shrimpy crustaceans are approximately two inches long. You might be sitting there thinking, Olivia, a shrimp is not an interesting enough creature to have on this list, but it was when researchers looked into them further, more specifically into their bellies, when things got a little weird. After further research, scientists realized that there was plastic in the bellies of all of these crustaceans. They found PET, which is a common plastic resin that is most commonly used in the fibers for clothing, packaging for food, and for plastic drinking bottles. How did we discover a new species, only to realize it had already discovered our plastic pollution? Scientists are hoping the discovery will bring more widespread attention to the plague of plastic pollution across our world. It probably isn't a great sign that it's affecting our undiscovered species, even in the more difficult to reach places. In our number 9 spot today we have the glowing jellyfish. Okay, we've all seen or at least heard of a jellyfish before, so it's not the most unusual discovery, but this fancy glowing one is definitely not your average run of the mill kind of jellyfish. In 2016, scientists were surveying the waters near the Mariana Trench when they saw what looked like a glowing flying saucer, but as it turns out, it was just this new undiscovered jellyfish laid out with its tentacles ready to catch some unsuspecting prey. Inside the bell of this jelly you can see some bright yellow bulb like lights and some bright red markings as well. The jellyfish also has two kinds of tentacles, one short and one long. No description of this guy would truly do it justice, so here's a quick video just for reference. In our number 8 spot today we have the Casper octopus. This is one creature that just might be the cutest on this list, and it was discovered a few years ago by a little deep diving robot called the Deep Discoverer. One day as the Deep Discoverer is you know, discovering things, it stumbles upon a tiny little octopus just hanging out on a flat rock all by itself. This octopus stumped scientists for a few reasons. Firstly, it kind of resembled a known common species of shallow water octopuses, but this one was found deep in the ocean. The second thing that stumped scientists was the ghostly white color they were seeing. Octopuses have certain pigments which allow them to change color, but this little guy seemingly didn't have them because he was ghostly and iridescent. At the time of the discovery, scientists were pretty sure this guy was a brand new species of octopus and even believed that it may belong to its own genus as well. In our number 7 spot today we have the Mariana Snailfish. In May of 2017, the Mariana Snailfish was caught on film at a depth of 8,178 meters in the Mariana Trench. At the time, this was the deepest fish ever recorded, which was a huge step forward for science. The fish was captured on video by a special little lander robot that was specifically designed for the crushing pressures of the deep sea in depths below 600 meters. The camera apparently had some sort of mackerel bait in order to entice the deep sea dwellers into getting close so the camera could get a good look at them. While this snailfish was an already known species, this video was able to catch it swimming 100 meters deeper than it ever had been found before. Was this guy just swimming to the beat of his own drum? Was he just desperate for the bait? Or maybe we just didn't previously know that these guys went that deep. The possibilities are endless. In our number 6 spot today we have the fang tooth. These creepy deep sea dwellers are exactly the kind of thing that you would think lives in the deep dark depths of the Mariana Trench. I truthfully think that they are so frightening so I really hope that they just stay down there. These fish are named after their teeth which totally makes sense considering the fact that these guys have teeth so large that in relation to their body size, they're the largest in the ocean. These guys have to have a special little pocket in the roof of their mouths which are used to store their teeth so that they can actually close their mouths. That is both disgusting and horrifying. The good news is that these guys do not have very good eyesight at all. But I guess with teeth like that, who needs eyes? It is currently believed that these guys hunt by just bumping into their prey, sensing vibrations and movements in the water. All I'm saying is that the Mariana Trench is definitely staying off of my list of travel locations. In our number 5 spot today we have the sponge. 
I don't know what it is about them, but sea sponges seriously gross me out. So, to my dismay, in 2015, deep sea researchers stumbled across an insanely huge sponge deep in the ocean. And when I say insanely huge, I'm talking about the biggest one we've ever found, the size of a van kind of huge. This thing looks like a huge brain and is approximately 11 and a half feet long, six and a half feet high, and almost five feet wide. Researchers explained that huge sponges like this one are integral to providing key ecosystem services, like filtering a ton of seawater, as well as the fact that they act as a habitat for a ton of different invertebrate and microbial species. Sea sponges are apparently really difficult to date, but it is known that some can live as long as 2,300 years, which is insane. So I guess while they look ultra weird and really freak me out, they aren't all that bad and do some really important work. Just another case of not judging a book by its cover. In our number 4 spot today we have the Gran Rojo Jellyfish. These guys were first discovered in the mid 1990s and weren't officially categorized as a new species until 2003. Not only did their discovery come with a new species classification, but also a new subfamily. The species was originally being called Big Ugly. Which seems like an unnecessary roast, but after some time, it was much more affectionately named Big Red. These guys are the largest of all sea jellies, growing to be around 76 centimeters in diameter. They have four to seven fleshy arms rather than the tentacles we're used to seeing on jellies. While most jellies are transparent, these guys are red all over. Because of their deep sea habitat, there is still so much we don't know about them, and only 23 have ever been actually found and identified. So while the research is currently lacking, scientists are doing their best to get us some more answers on these big red jellyfish. In our number 3 spot today we have the barrel eye. Okay. This guy is one weird looking fish. The barrel eye fish is also known as a spook fish and they of course get their names due to their appearance. The fish are relatively small and are best known for their extremely unusual, transparent, fluid filled heads. When these fish were first discovered there were so many questions surrounding them. At first scientists thought that their eyes were fixed in place, but after further research it was able to be determined that they are able to rotate them both up and forward. This fish is usually found motionless, just hanging out in depths of around 600 to 800 meters or 2,000 to 2,600 feet in the ocean. This fish has been known for quite some time with the first discovery coming in 1939, but it wasn't until 2004 that a photographer of a live one was captured for the world to also see how unique these guys really are. There also used to be many drawings of these guys, but never with their transparent head because of the fact that it gets destroyed when the fish is brought up from the deep sea. So, not that I think anyone is going to go diving in the Mariana Trench soon, but if you do, don't bring these guys up from their home, they're happy down there with their heads fully intact. In our number 2 spot today we have the Vampire Squid. The Vampire Squid is the last surviving member of its order and it has similarities with both the squid as well as the octopus, which might make it a contender for most threatening animal on today's list. Like the Dumbo octopus from part 1 of this video, this guy has little ear like fins that help it propel itself through the water, but unlike the Dumbo octopus, it isn't small and cute and sweet looking. Like a jellyfish, the vampire squid has a gelatinous body that helps it move quicker through the depths of the sea. The vampire squid is covered in light producing organs called photophores, which they are able to use in a way that produces disorienting flashes so as to confuse their prey. While the vampire squid doesn't have ink, it does have the ability, when in really dangerous situations, to shoot out a bioluminescent mucus at whatever is attacking it. Also, the squid is able to regenerate its arms. So I think this all goes to say that if you were in a fight with a vampire squid, I really hope you came prepared because he sure did. In our number 1 spot today we have the ghost fish. Okay, well of course I had to end off today's list with just one more deep sea ghostly creature, and this one is actually super cool. This little ghost fish was caught on camera in 2016 as it was casually swimming along a ridge around 8202 feet or 2500 meters deep in the ocean. The 
fish is around 10 centimeters long and has translucent, scaleless skin and the creepiest, colorless eyes on any fish I've ever seen. Here's the craziest thing about this whole ordeal though. This was the first time a live fish from its family has ever been seen before. This little fish swimming along, minding his own business, has absolutely no idea that he was a huge discovery for the human scientists on land. There is still so much that is left a mystery about these guys, but any kind of new discovery is most definitely always a step in the right direction. Starting off this list at our number 10 spot, we have gigantic amphipods. Amphipods are shrimp like creatures that are usually less than 10 millimeters or 0.4 inches long. That all changed when these deep sea dwelling amphipods were located, however, with their massive selves measuring around 28 centimeters long or 11 inches, with the largest one ever found coming in at an insane 33 centimeters or 13 inches long. Like imagine a shrimp the size of your forearm. These guys are basically the largest amphipods ever recorded and they've only been found at some of the greatest depths of our oceans. The first specimens of this species were collected at the end of the 19th century and they are usually found in abyssal plains in both the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean, but of course, considering what we are here talking about today, they are also found in the Mariana Trench. Other than their crazy size difference, these guys are a lot like other amphipods, so it's unclear exactly why they are so large. These guys are basically like the shack of the amphipod world. In our number 9 spot today we have the fan fin sea devil. These guys are a type of anglerfish which we talked about in part 1, but these guys truly need their own moment to shine. They have a bioluminescent lure which they use to both attract their prey as well as keep themselves from becoming the prey. These fish have little hairy spikes all over their body which are used as sensors to help the fish balance as well as helping the fish check the water surrounding it. Kind of like the whiskers on a cat, but much less adorable and cuddly. These guys, their hairy spikes and their sharp teeth are absolutely terrifying to look at, but the good news is that they're relatively quite small. The females of this species are 6 to 8 inches long, and the males are even smaller, usually only measuring about half an inch in length. In our number 8 spot today, we have the lanternfish. These guys get their name from their bioluminescent abilities as they have tiny organs called photophores located on their head, underside, and tail. Like many other bioluminescent sea creatures, they use their light to attract their prey, but it is also thought that the lanternfish might use their light to also signal other lanternfish during mating. Apparently lanternfish are the most common of all deep sea fish and they play an important role as the prey for other larger deep sea fish. One thing that these fish do, which is unlike any other on this list, is that while during the day they are in the deepest depths of the ocean, during the night they prefer to swim a little closer to the surface in order to feed. It is thought that they do this to follow the path of plankton, which is their main food source. It is also thought that this migration pattern might help them avoid becoming lunch to squid and penguins, which are their main predators. Another interesting thing about them is that different species of lanternfish have been known to almost layer themselves at different depths, which is thought to possibly help reduce competition between species. In our number 7 spot today, we have Foraminifera. These guys are giant single celled organisms that are kind of like oversized amoebas, and they can be found in the sediment on seabeds throughout the world. In 1995, however, when Japanese researchers were able to collect samples of sediment located in the Mariana Trench, they found 432 living ones. I know I made these guys sound really large before, but I just mean large in terms of the single celled organism world. They're still super tiny, and they are usually found with a hard outer shell but not the ones found in the trench. These guys have basically found a way to adapt by building their own shells from proteins, organic polymers, and even sand. The ones most commonly found in the Mariana Trench are called xenophyophores, and these guys use the fact that grains of sand are mostly made out of silicon dioxide, which is the main constituent of glass, to their advantage. They basically glue sand from ocean sediments, cast off shells, and microbial skeletons to make their own kind of pressure proof shells. So I guess they're the engineers of the deep sea? In our number 6 spot today we have the football fish. Just another member of the angler fish family, these guys of course get their name from their football like shape. The females of this species are the ones who have the bioluminescent lantern on their heads which lure in their prey for a tasty little snack. Here's where things get really different though. 
as their little lantern on their heads is swaying back and forth, luring in an unsuspecting fish. Once their prey gets close enough, the football fish will then shoot out a bioluminescent liquid. This liquid acts to momentarily blind their prey, which is when the football fish grabs their prey and swallows them whole with their large mouths. That is definitely quite the hunting technique. These guys are similar to other anglerfish with the females being larger than the males, and they also have a bit of a different shape. In terms of mating, because the depths of the ocean are so dark, the males will bite onto the females until their skin grows together, which is so gross sounding. From here, he is able to fertilize the eggs to produce more little weird looking football fishies. In our number five spot today, we have the benthocodon. We have all seen a jellyfish before, but these deep sea dwellers are unlike any of the ones we usually find. Firstly, they prefer depths of around 2,500 feet or 762 meters, usually right on the sea floor. These guys are actually quite small and compact with their bell usually measuring just two to three centimeters in diameter. Despite their small size, however, they still have around 1,500 little wispy tentacles that help propel them through the icy cold depths. These jellies like to chow down on small crustaceans and tiny unicellular organisms, but sometimes their meals are bioluminescent, which is what has led to one of their other unique features on these jellies. This unique feature would be the red color that can be found in part of their bell. Most jellyfish we know of are transparent, and if this was the case for these ones, their bioluminescent meals would be a dead giveaway for the larger hungry predators lurking around the deep sea. This is why the bit of red that they have in their bell is so important to their survival as it acts as a cover for this blue glow so that they can continue on their merry way throughout the dark depths of the ocean. In our number four spot today, we have the tripod fish. When you see these guys, their name totally makes a lot of sense. These deep sea fish have elongated fin rays in the tail as well as two in the pelvic fins, which they use to prop themselves up and just basically stand there like their own little built in tripod. These little fin rays almost appear as antenna-like and usually while these fish are standing in one spot, they can be seen facing upstream. They don't appear to have any kind of special visual adaptations to help them find food in their low light environment, but that's okay because these guys can find their prey without even seeing it. When these guys are standing on their little tripod, they are also at the perfect height to catch shrimp, tiny fish, and small crustaceans that are swimming by. If the catch isn't as simple as the current bringing the prey right into their mouths, the tripod fish is able to sense the prey with their pectoral fins, which kind of act like hands. Once they feel the prey and realize it's edible, they can use these fins to just knock their meal right into their mouths. This is all why they like to face the current, just to make getting their next meal a little easier. And in our number three spot today, we have the owl fish. These creepy looking guys are also often referred to as stout black smelt, as they are a species of deep sea smelt, but their owl fish name comes from their extremely large eyes in relation to their body. These eyes are able to capture even the faintest glimmer of light, which isn't the most common occurrence in the deep dark depths of the Mariana Trench, but this is what helps them spot and capture their prey, which are usually small crustaceans and jellies. There truly isn't a ton of interesting information I can find out about these guys other than their huge eyes, but I did find this cool video of one fighting with a black eyed squid, so here's a little clip of that. The fish has a few tricks up its sleeve as well. Owlfish have a very quick escape response, and with a flick of their tails, they can dart out of reach of a striking squid. In our number two spot today, we have the telescope octopus. There has been a kind of octopus on every part of this list, so we have got to keep the tradition alive and talk about the weird but interesting telescope octopus. These guys got their name for their unique protruding eyes, which haven't been seen in any other kind of octopus ever before. The difference in their eyes allows them to have better peripheral vision so as to see both their prey and their predators better. Their eyes also rotate, which I'm sure is super helpful to them, but just seems like something I wish I didn't know. These guys don't really hang out on the ocean floor like many other octopuses do, and instead they prefer to just float or dangle in the deepest currents of the ocean. Most octopuses also tend to swim horizontally, but not this guy. He likes to stay vertical, and it's unclear why, but it could perhaps be to make it harder for predators to see its shape. The telescope 
octopus has nearly transparent skin, and in between each of the eight tentacles, there's a delicate webbing that fully makes it look like some kind of ghost. In our number one spot today, we have aluminum plated amphipods. Okay, so we talked about the ginormous amphipods before, but now we have another, smaller, but equally as cool kind. These guys are found not only in the Mariana Trench, but in the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest part of the trench. Amphipods usually have shells made out of calcium carbonate, but the extreme environment in these guys' habitat make their shells basically just dissolve. They of course can't just be walking around naked and shellless, so what do they do? They adapt in order to preserve their shells. After collecting some of these guides from the deepest part of the ocean, scientists were able to realize that their exoskeleton contained aluminum on the surface, which then led to the question, how did these guys find the metal since it's so sparse in seawater? Well, as it turns out, these guys use sugar-based chemicals in their bellies to extract aluminum ions from the mud on the seafloor that it ends up ingesting while devouring the plant debris that floats down from the surface. In alkaline seawater, these aluminum ions form what is called aluminum hydroxide gel, which is a compound that we as humans use for things like protecting our upset stomachs from stomach acid. This gel then coats their shell and acts as a type of chemical protection so as to keep the calcium carbonate exoskeleton from dissolving. I don't know guys, I just think that's one of the coolest things I've ever heard a shrimp do. This is the first known amphipod to do something like this and these guys are now an important part of researching how maybe one day we can find an environmentally friendly way to produce aluminum. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot we have spoonworms. Spoonworms are a strange looking little creature that can be found in many areas of the ocean and of course even in the Mariana Trench. These guys are basically just plump, unsegmented worms that find their homes in the burrows on the seabed. Different members of this animal family can live at different temperatures, but most of the deep sea variety live deeper than 3,000 meters where the water is icy cold. The deep sea spoonworms often see the females growing much larger than the males, and in most instances, the males end up living inside, or at least on the females. I'm not entirely sure of the logistics of that, but it does sound awful. In these species, their stomachs are much longer than their bodies, so their gut ends up folded and coiled inside of them, which I guess isn't unsimilar to human intestines. In our number 9 spot today, we have volcanic glass. Did you know that there are volcanoes underwater, even in the deep sea? Right near the Mariana Trench in 2015, scientists found evidence of what was the deepest ever known volcanic eruption. They didn't catch the actual eruption, but they knew it had happened because because of the volcanic glass, they found 3 miles or 4,800 meters below the sea. This discovery was huge because it is not often that we find deep sea volcanic eruptions, but it was the first time scientists had found one that had erupted very recently. The volcanic glass is created because of the hot magma coming into contact with the icy cold waters, which cools it down quickly. This discovery helped scientists understand what happens when an eruption occurs underwater such as how some quick moving creatures find their home in the aftermath almost immediately. It is said that around 80% of the world's volcanic eruptions occur under the water, and it's still something we know so little about, so this discovery gave us an incredibly important look at what happens afterwards. In our number 8 spot today we have the sea cucumber. Sea cucumbers are creatures that can be found all over the oceans on our earth, even in the most extreme environments such as the Mariana Trench. These guys have many different appearances, but they all look somewhat like a giant worm or some kind of spiky, slimy cucumber. They're often called the vacuum cleaners of the ocean as they mainly feed on tiny particles of algae or microscopic marine animals, and they play a vital role in recycling marine nutrients. They have a bunch of little tentacles that they use to eat, and they can often be found on or close to the sea floor. There are a few species of sea cucumbers that can swim, but not all of them do. In some species, their tentacles are even able to secrete a mucus net that can be used to trap small planktonic organisms. One really crazy thing about some kinds of sea cucumbers is that they can expel their internal organs when threatened. This would seem like a huge problem, but sea cucumbers can regenerate their organs quite quickly after. They also don't have a brain, which I felt like was important to include. I guess maybe if we take our brains out, then can we regenerate our own? organs? Uh, 
I'm just joking, obviously. In our number seven spot today, we have rat tails. These fish are usually fairly large, and while most species belonging to this family are deep sea fish, there's one specific species that are found in the Mariana Trench. These fish have larger heads and eyes, but then their body tapers out into a thin tail fin, which is how they got their common name. Rat tails are one of the most common deep water fish, and they like to snack on things like smaller fish, some kinds of crustaceans, and even sometimes lanternfish. These fish are great scavengers, which is an important part of the deep sea ecosystem. When these fish are young, they tend to stay in more shallow water, but as they grow older, they migrate further into the icy cold depths of the sea. In our number six spot today, we have barophilic bacteria. This bacteria is characterized by its preference for an environment with pressure greater than our atmospheric pressure, which of course makes the trench a perfect candidate for a home. These bacteria have been isolated from deep sea environments and found to grow rapidly at low temperatures and high pressures. This low temperature, high pressure combo that is found in the deep sea environment is usually the cause for the decrease of the fluidity of lipids, as well as the depression of the function of biological membranes. But this doesn't happen in this bacteria, which has led to the theory that they must have some sort of mechanism that allows their lipids to adapt to their extreme environment. Aside from their superpower, these bacteria help to support life by being a source of carbon for the deep sea animals that end up ingesting them. In our number five spot today, we have immense pressure. In every part of this video series, I have talked about the extreme environment that is the Mariana Trench and just how much pressure exists down there, but I haven't taken the time to really dive into just how much pressure is down there. So we're going to do that now. The deeper you go into the ocean, the more pressure you'd feel. Close to the surface of the ocean, we're sitting at a base of one atmospheric pressure, but when you go just 10 meters deep, that number already doubles. Considering the Mariana Trench is 11,000 meters deep, this is obviously going to increase greatly. The pressure causes the air in your body to compress, and the deeper you go, the more dense the water becomes. While the concept of the increasing pressure is easy to understand, understand, it truly is really hard to conceptualize how this change happens and just how deep this trench really is. One atmospheric pressure is 1.01325 bars, which is the unit used to measure pressure. So like I mentioned before, this is where we are sitting when close to the surface of the ocean, but in the depths of the Mariana Trench, that number skyrockets to 1,086 bars, which apparently would be the equivalent of 100 elephants standing on you. So it's suddenly making a lot more sense as to why people don't journey down to the Challenger Deep very often. In our number four spot today, we have arrowtooth eels. The arrowtooth eels that reside in the Mariana Trench are a species that not much is known about. These eels range somewhere from 23 to 160 centimeters or 9.1 to 63 inches in length. They are bottom dwelling fish and can be found in waters around 3,700 meters or 12,000 and 100 feet deep. They can be told apart from other eels in their early stages because of their telescopic eyes during the larva stage. These guys like to feed on the scraps left over from other larger fish meals as well as invertebrates, but they have also been known to be partly parasitic as they sometimes burrow into the flesh of other fish. Here's a little clip of one swimming past a camera that is located around 11,000 meters deep in the sea. In our number three spot today, we have the hydrothermal vents. The Mariana Trench is part of the Pacific Ring of Fire, which is a tectonically active region where plates are colliding and causing subduction, which is how the trench itself was formed. Through this tectonic activity, as seawater seeps downwards through the oceanic crust, it gets really hot and becomes very rich in chemicals. This leads to the water becoming so buoyant that it comes back out of the surface of the sea floor, and this is what is called a hydrothermal vent. The water coming out of the vent is that same super hot, super chemically rich water, and it is an extremely important part of underwater ecosystems. The water from the vent is highly acidic and hot, while the water in the depths of the ocean is slightly basic and freezing cold. There are many different smaller species who come to the vent areas because of the chemicals in the water, as well as the heat, which helps certain types of food sources grow, which they then want to consume. This then leads to it being a feeding hot spot 
as larger predators can also come to the vent to feed on the other smaller organisms that are already in the feeding area. There are usually a high amount of animals found in the area of a hydrothermal vent, but not a wide variety of different animals, as the temperature extreme is not suited for everyone in the deep sea. In our number two spot today, we have vent crabs. Okay, so to piggyback off of the last point, we have a creature that loves the hydrothermal vents, and that is the aptly named vent crab. These white crabs are actually endemic to hydrothermal vents, and they were first described in 1980. The crabs in this family are usually blind and abundant. In fact, their numbers are so vast that scientists often use the clusters of them to help find the location of the hydrothermal vents. The eyes of vent crabs change throughout their life, which helps them adapt to their environment. Young vent crabs usually have eyes that would be comparable to their shallow water companions, but upon metamorphosis, their eyes degenerate and become naked retinas. Hydrothermal vents produce light in the infrared wavelengths, and this change in the vent crab's eyes actually allows them to better see this light, although it causes them to not be able to see most other things. It's like a similar concept to night vision goggles. So basically, vent crabs have night vision, I guess? It is so interesting to see and learn about how these deep sea creatures adapt to their individual environments and circumstances. Vent crabs often eat tiny organisms and bacteria, which is another reason they thrive near the vents. In our number one spot today, we have giant isopods. Before I dive into this number one point, make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you're enjoying the video so far. It really helps us out. Despite their appearance, these guys are neither aliens or pill bugs and are just another one of those strange and weirdly large deep sea creatures. These rather large crustaceans can reach lengths of around 15 inches, and while that's not the biggest deep sea creature out there, that's still pretty insane for the isopod world. These guys get their size from what is known as deep sea gigantism, which is an evolutionary tendency for deep sea creatures to grow larger than their shallow water counterparts. It isn't exactly clear why this happens, but it does, and is seen in a few different species, such as those giant shrimps we were talking about last time. It is thought that it may be due to the cold temperatures, which may increase cell size and lifespan, which both may lead to increased body size. Giant isopods are related to wood lice, albeit distant cousins, which is why they look kind of similar. These guys are scavengers who usually wait to collect the scraps of whatever is left over from another predator's meal, whether those leftovers are located on the sea floor or if they're falling from the waters above like sea snow. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have giant tube worms. These guys were totally unknown to scientists until the discovery of the hydrothermal vents that we talked about last time. Like the vent crabs, these giant tube worms also live off of and thrive in these extreme areas. These giant tube worms feed off of the tiny bacteria that get their energy from the chemicals coming from the vent water. These giant tube worms grow to be around 8 feet or over over two meters, and they have no mouth or digestive tract. Instead, they rely on those bacteria we just talked about to live inside of them for their food, like a wonderful symbiotic relationship. These guys can best be spotted by their bright red plume, which is used for exchanging compounds with the seawater, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide. I could talk about these guys for forever because there's so many interesting facts about them, but I'll end off with just one more, and that is that the outer shell of these worms is made up of a natural substance called chitin which is also the main component of the exoskeletons of crabs, lobsters, and shrimps. Okay, one more quickly, but I swear it's the last one. These two worms also have no eyes, but they can sense movements and vibrations, and they will retreat into their protective tubes when they feel threatened. Okay. Now I'm actually done. In our number nine spot today, we have the frogfish. Frogfish are weird looking creatures, but they are also incredible at disguising themselves. They're fairly sedentary fish and they love to find their home on the seafloor at depths of around 1,000 feet or 300 meters. They range from a few inches to a foot in length and their colors vary greatly, which is how they're able to blend in with their surroundings so easily. They actually have the ability to change their color if their environment changes, with the process taking somewhere from a few days to a few weeks. While they can glide through the water, they sometimes also use their fins to basically walk along the sea floor. They feed off of things like other fish and invertebrates, and on their heads they have a special modified fin that kind of resembles a fishing rod with bait on it, which they use to lure in their prey. Little does the unsuspecting prey fish know, while it thinks it's about to get a meal, it's about to become the frogfish's meal. Frogfish are able to eat prey that is much larger than themselves as they have the ability to expand their mouth cavity to 12 
12 times its resting size, which is insane. In our number eight spot today, we have the deep sea lizardfish. Deep sea lizardfish are a small family of deep water fish who are related to the telescope fish. These guys have flat heads and curved, barbed teeth, and they grow up to 78 centimeters or 31 inches in length, which makes them a pretty moderately sized fish. They prefer to stay at depths of 1,600 meters or 5,200 feet, and they are actually one of the world's deepest living apex predators. These lizard fish are known to eat anything that comes their way, including other fish of their own kind. Despite the lack of light in the depths of the ocean, these guys have large eyes and pupils, and their vision is actually really important for their prey detection, as their well developed eyes allow them to see any residual or bioluminescent light. Not a lot is known about their reproduction habits, but one thing that is known is that the deep sea lizard fish have both male and female reproductive organs, which is thought to be an adaptation to low population density. In our number seven spot today, we have the ghost shark. These guys are also commonly referred to as ratfish or spookfish, and their closest living relatives are sharks and rays, but their last common ancestor lived with them around 400 million years ago. Ghost fish were once abundant and diverse, but throughout the years that has changed greatly, and they are now mostly confined to deep water. They prefer to live around 2,600 meters or 8,500 feet deep, and they have elongated bodies with bulky heads. They grow to be around 150 centimeters or 4.9 feet, and their skeletons are made of cartilage. They don't have scales and instead have smooth skin, and they range in color from black to a sort of brownish gray color. These guys use electroreception to find their prey, which is the ability to perceive natural electric stimuli, and they also have a venomous spine in front of their dorsal fins, which acts as a form of protection for them. In our number six spot today, we have the long tail red snapper. These fish feature a beautiful red color, and they also have very large eyes, which help it make its home in the deep sea. These guys can grow to be three feet or 0.9 meters long and 30 pounds. They have a forked tail that grows larger as the fish matures, and sometimes the tips of the tails have a black or white color on the ends. It takes about four years for these guys to reach maturity, which is relatively long for the fish world. There are a few species of this kind of fish, and they can be found in many areas of our oceans, and they are considered a delicacy in some places and cultures. It probably isn't the Mariana Trench variety that people are eating, however, as that would be quite a costly and difficult meal to achieve. In our number five spot today, we have acorn worms. There are a few species of acorn worms, but one in particular finds its home in the deepest points of our seas. These acorn worms can grow up to three feet or just under a meter in length, and they often have brightly colored bodies. They have cilia on their underside, which are used to glide over the ocean floor, albeit slowly as they travel at about three inches per hour. As they move along, they suck the waste from the ocean floor into their gut, and they also constantly leave a trail of feces behind them, which is a nice gross fact for you. When they are ready to move to a new feeding location, they empty their gut, and then they just drift over the bottom, and they do this with the help of an excreted balloon of mucus. So this whole point is just a double whammy of grossness. They can usually be found at depths of around 1,500 to 3,700 meters or 4,900 to 12,100 feet. In our number four spot today, we have basket stars. Basket stars belong to the same phylum as starfish, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers. They resemble starfish, but they have five long, slender, and flexible arms. Each one of the five arms also branches out itself repeatedly, with each branch getting thinner, which makes the final branch quite thin and usually curled at the end. The central disc of the basket star where all of the arms come off of is very distinct. While some basket stars have neatly placed arms that look amazing and beautiful, some basket stars look pretty wild and strange. Basket stars move by wiggling their arms around, and they have the ability to curl into a ball when they feel threatened. They also use their arms to catch their prey as they position themselves in the current of the water. They feed on things like krill, small crustaceans, and zooplankton. Surprisingly, these guys do have a mouth, which is located on the bottom side of their disc. In our number three spot today, we have predatory tunicate. These guys are basically like the Venus flytraps of the deep sea. These invertebrates make their home anchored along the deep sea canyon walls and sea floor as they wait for their meals to drift on by. Like the flytrap, when they catch a piece of prey, their mouth will snap shut until they are finished digesting their meal. These guys start off life looking kind of like tadpoles, and then they swim around until they find a place to land, which they do upside down by secreting an adhesive to keep them in place. From here, they 
undergo a metamorphosis and have an incredibly large change. Despite having to worry about its predators, these guys are also very picky about where they live. They need to make sure the chemicals in the water as well as the temperature of the water are just right and it's also imperative that they stay in place once they find their spot. If they're removed from the canyon wall, they unfortunately will die. The predatory tunicate may seem a little weird, but one cool thing is that they have been found to be useful in the medical world and they may even have the potential to help with conditions such as melanoma and leukemia, which is absolutely incredible. In our number two spot today, we have the deep sea hermit crab. Okay, many of us have seen or heard of a hermit crab before, so at a first thought, they aren't the weirdest thing out there. But as it turns out, the deep sea variety is quite interesting. Instead of these guys carrying around empty gastropod shells like the hermit crabs we are used to, these guys instead carry around sea anemones, and it is one of the weirdest looking things I have ever seen. Looks like these crabs are missing a pair of legs, but instead the legs have actually been adapted to hold the anemone in place. I don't know about you guys, but I really think this one looks like some sort of disgusting sea spider that I hope just stays at the deepest depths of the Mariana Trench. No offense to the crab, it's just not my cup of tea. In the number one spot today, we have the Daikoku Sea Mount. This sea mount is located in the Mariana Arc, about 325 meters or 1,060 feet below sea level and it was found to be hydrothermally active in 2003. In 2014, it was discovered that the submarine volcano was either actively erupting or had been very recently. Along with these discoveries came the realization that this seamount also features a pool of liquid sulfur that was covered in some sort of black coating. This little sulfur cauldron is approximately 4.5 by 3 meters large and is 420 meters deep. There are rising gases like carbon dioxide and hydrogen that are coming out of the pool and they are moving that black crust that sits on top. The rising gases appear like smoke, but underwater, which is super cool. The really cool thing about this little sulfur lake is that it is almost an anomaly on Earth, and one of the few other sulfur lakes that are known is actually located on Jupiter's moon, Io. While there have been a few other liquid sulfur lakes found on Earth, the one located near this seamount is the most impressive one we have ever found on our planet. Number 10. Ping pong tree sponge. Doesn't sound scary, but it is. This one is like the Venus flytrap of the trench. Even though it's got a silly name, this creature devours its prey in the most painful way possible. Though it looks pretty harmless, kind of like a bunch of fluffy dandelions tied together. Stretching out from the stem, there are like bubble gum bubbles extending in every direction, but don't be fooled by the double bubble persona. Attached to each globe are spicules with little hooks on them. These hooks act like Velcro and attach onto the fine hair of crustaceans. Once they hook, the sponge draws its cells towards the prey and begins a process called phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is the ingestion of bacteria, and the process takes tiny pieces bit by bit until the creature is no more. What a way to go! Huh? It would be like someone stripping off a portion of your cells until you utterly dissolve. Ah! That's horrific! Gross. Number nine. Giantism. Considering life can indeed survive in the deepest areas of the Marianas Trench, it's opened up a lot of questions about the conditions under which life can develop and survive. Say, for instance, if life can thrive here, but can it survive on Europa, for example? But not only are there creatures living there, some of them are giant. This is known as deep sea giantism. Giant amoebas and isopods have been discovered, and scientists are aching to know why. Massive amphipods have been discovered and get bigger the deeper they go, while the more shallow the water, the smaller they are. So it begs the question, what else is bigger than it should be lurking down there? Number 8. Zombie Worms if worms make you squirm, then I give you full permission to skip to number 7. But for everyone else, I'm glad you're sticking with me. Zombie worms, aka Osidax, may not be your typical zombies, but they share some similar traits. They like to eat things that are dead and alive? I don't know. These 
These little guys, once they latch on, are capable of devouring bones of some of the biggest marine creatures on Earth. Some of the bones are as hard as stone. While they sit there looking terrifying, they use a potent acid to dissolve the bone and bacteria for their consumption. They also have a very strange mating ritual, as the males actually live inside the females, and it's the females who devour the bones. So I'm almost glad the real zombies don't reproduce that way, or at least that I that I know of. Like, there's probably a comic out there inspired by these special creatures, so who knows. We'll see that in the next like 30 days later, 28 days later, whatever it is. Number 7, Dragonfish. Tiny but mighty has never been so strange, but it's so small, but it's so small. How could I be so scared of it? Dude, the whole world is terrified of spiders. So don't ask me. They're like this big, but they just make me want to die. The dragonfish is a scaleless, slimy fish with massive teeth compared to the size of its body. If one bit you, it'd be like being stabbed by tiny needles. Like many others on this list, this creature is capable of emitting its own light by way of bioluminescence. Like an anglerfish, it has a small probe that glows to attract its next meal. It feeds mainly on small crustaceans. These poor, poor crustaceans, they've got a hard life. And fish, though it's not really picky. I don't think it can be when you live down there. It can withstand the immense body crushing weight of depths of 5,000 feet, so do not be fooled. You gotta be an incredibly powerful fish to be able to withstand that kind of environment. Number six, the frilled shark. Fun fact about this keen survivor, the frilled shark was thought to be an extinct species until two men in Australia accidentally caught one in their net back in 2015. A terrifying combination of an eel and a shark, these apex predators are notorious for swallowing their prey whole. It's slim pickings down there, they don't know when they're going to get their next meal so you might as well just gulp it down. They have several rows of sharp teeth, perfect for hooking their prey into the depths of their stomach. They mostly enjoy squids, but have been known to enjoy some fish and even their own kind. They are incredibly rare, as you can probably guess, so very little is known about their ecology. So the information we do have are from the ones we've managed to capture. But perhaps the reason they have survived 80 million years, 80 million years, is because of how well they've flown under the radar. Makes you wonder if there are any any other deep sea creatures we think are extinct, but are simply waiting. Ooh. Number five, the viper fish. I guess if you don't see the light of day, there's no reason to, to look good, I guess. Though it is cool to be resilient, it doesn't come gift wrapped. The viper fish is yet another really unusual looking fish on this list with a ruthless attitude. It has huge fang like teeth so big they don't fit in its already massive mouth. Tiny but mighty, this creature reaches about 11 to 12 inches in size and are capable of reaching very high speeds. They claim their meals by ramming into them and impaling them with their sharp teeth. They know this because the first vertebra right behind the head is designed to absorb the shock. Sometimes though, it plays the waiting game. It uses its long dorsal fin conveniently equipped with together now, bioluminescent photophore. You'd think with so many creatures playing the same game, the smaller prey would be wise to it, but thankfully for the viper fish, not yet, maybe later. Number four, fan fin sea devils. Life always finds a way, and in the darkest, coldest parts of the world, creatures like the fan fin sea devil have come up with some weird ways to survive. The fan fin is a type of angler fish, but instead of one bioluminescent lure, they have a whole army of them. It looks like a fish with a bunch of hairy spores stretching out from its body. They flow through the water seeking any potential prey, plus they help the fish balance. Thankfully they are pretty tiny, with the females reaching only about 6 inches in length, so if humans actually figured out how to swim down there in a wetsuit, its bite may hurt but it won't cause much damage. The males are actually so small they are considered parasites that latch onto the female in order to reproduce. Ruthless, man. Woo. These ladies. These ladies are fierce down there in the depths. Number three, the barrel eye fish. Ever wish you could see into someone's head? 
Uh, well, chances are, if you've thought about it, something like it exists. The bear live fish is a creature that leaves it all out on the table, has nothing to hide, and it creeps me the heck out. On top of its head is a transparent dome, and the two glowing orbs inside it are actually its eyes. It seriously looks like it swims straight out of a comic book, but hey, truth is stranger than fiction. Its eyes are ultra sensitive to light and can rotate up to see silhouettes of their prey. They capture as much light as possible, and they're flat fins allow them to hover and wait for some unlucky dinner to pass on by. Weird, creepy, strange, I don't like it. Number two, the goblin shark. Guys, this poor guy, this poor dude. I, I, can't, I can't help but make a face every time I look at this creature. It looks like Tim Burton drew the ugliest thing he could think of and nature thought it was a great idea. You know? After all, you don't get called a goblin shark for looking pretty unless you're David Bowie. He's the goblin king, and he's so nice. The creepiest thing about them is that they can shoot their jaw out three inches in order to lunge out at their prey. Their long, unfortunate looking snouts are covered with sensory organs called ampullae, which will help sense electrical fields. They can technically see electricity, which is kind of cool. Their main sources of food consist of some creatures already listed, like the anglerfish, squid, rat tails, dragonfish, along with cephalopods and squid. So at least they're eating some of the other scary things, but still. Try getting that image out of your head. Like the, just the jaw, it's like I don't like it. And last but not least, human garbage. Out of all the creatures and discoveries on this list, this one sent the biggest chill down my spine. 35,000 feet below sea level, human garbage has been found. A plastic grocery bag is the deepest known piece of plastic trash ever found at a depth of 36,000 feet inside the trench. It was found when scientists looked through the deep sea debris database, a collection of videos and photos from over 5,010 dives over 30 years. Plastic was the most prevalent of all the debris in the database, making up 89%. It was mostly the single use plastic fork or water bottle, so think about that the next time you go for takeout. You might accidentally stab an anglerfish. Starting us off at number 10 is a plastic bag. That's right folks, even the deepest spot on earth isn't free of man's worst creation ever. Single use plastics. During one of the deepest dives ever recorded, famous underwater explorer Victor Vescovo traveled seven miles below the ocean's surface down to the Mariana Trench. While down there, Vescovo and his crew discovered tons of new and interesting things, but not all of them were cool. He reported that he also found a plastic bag and even some candy wrappers. Down at the deepest place on earth. So, that's cool. Folks, I don't think it's a hard concept to understand, but please don't litter. Things like plastic bags were not made to help out anyone but ourselves. These cause a great danger to our wildlife all around the world, and if we have to use these materials, just please dispose of them properly. No one else should have to put up with your trash except for the garbage man. In our number nine spot today, we have the fact that life exists. The first time anyone ever went on a deep dive into the Mariana Trench, no one was exactly expecting to find signs of life in the extreme environment of the the deep sea. So it was quite a shock when they found out it was absolutely teeming with life. Because of the lack of sunlight, or really any light, in the Mariana Trench, you won't find any plant life or algae, but there are tons of living beings, from microorganisms to scary looking fish. All of the life in the trench has had to adapt in one way or another in order to live in this environment, whether that is naturally developing pressure proof shells, or having insane eyesight that can catch even the faintest glimmer, or having other heightened senses that can help detect prey or predators. All of these special adaptations help us understand more about how life in the deep sea evolved, but some can even be used to help us advance scientifically and medically. It is no small feat to head down to the Mariana Trench, but the more we can discover down there, the better. At number 8 we have Jupiter-like microbes. Say what? Back in 2012, during the Deep Sea Challenge expedition, researchers found these fuzzy mats of bacteria clinging to the rocks at the bottom of the trench. Usually one of the first things scientists look for in the harshest places on Earth are any signs of life possible. It helps them understand how life can be possible in parts of the world or even the universe that don't operate like Earth's habitable places. When scientists explored the Serena deep part of the trench with a robotic lander, they found evidence of a thriving microbial community down and around the deep sea rocks. These microbes appear to feed off of 
the chemicals produced with the sea when the sea floor rocks react with the water because they don't rely on the falling of the marine snow. It raises questions and possible hypotheses for scientists that maybe this is how some life forms exist in the farthest reach of our universe, such as Jupiter and Saturn's moons. In our number seven spot today, we have the Daikoku Seamount. This seamount is located within the Mariana Arc and was fairly recently found to be hydrothermally active. So basically, it is a functioning underwater volcano, which is super cool. That is not even the cool and unexpected discovery I want to talk about today. During the submarine Ring of Fire expedition in 2006, it was realized that this seamount happens to also feature a pool of liquid sulfur. That might not seem like the most amazing thing, but it is definitely very cool. Firstly, the way it looks is absolutely insane because it has gases rising off of it, which appear as smoke, but like smoke underwater. I don't know the science behind it, but all I know is that it looks like nothing I've ever seen before. The next reason why this is super cool is because of the fact that this is almost never seen here on Earth, and the only other time we found a comparable pool of sulfur to this one has been on Jupiter's moon Io. At number six, we have the Mariana snailfish. At 8,143 meters below the surface, scientists discovered a new kind of fish they call the Mariana snailfish. This is a white translucent fish that has broad wing like like fins and an eel like tail and slowly glides near the bottom of the ocean floor. You can also see its liver from the outside of its body. Eww. While this is the deepest they have ever found an actual fish, researchers don't believe there is much more swimming below that. The amount of pressure is so high that they don't believe any fish is chemically able to withstand the destabilizing effects of its proteins at the depth. So the Mariana snailfish may just be the deepest dwelling fish on the entire planet, which I'm sure we are all hoping for some large, weird, space looking like deep sea monster. But for now, we will just have to settle for a snailfish. It's okay, little guy. I still love you. In our number five spot today, we have human mercury pollution. It was once believed that methyl mercury was mostly produced in the top few hundred meters of the ocean, which would have limited the mercury bioaccumulation because it was thought that the fish who make their home in the deep sea would have a very limited opportunity to ingest the methyl mercury. But a recent discovery has shown that this is just not true. According to two separate studies, which were presented at the Goldschmidt Geochemistry Conference, there is clear evidence of the presence of both man made made and natural methyl mercury which is quite toxic. This means that since this is spreading to the absolute depths of the Mariana Trench, the pollution is turning out to be much more widespread than what was once thought. They know that it is coming from the mercury in the upper ocean because of some sort of isotope evidence. The reason this discovery is important is because when mercury reaches the depths of the sea, it is turned into methyl mercury, the super toxic one, by tiny microbes. From there it gets eaten by small crustaceans who then get eaten by fish who then get eaten by bigger fish and so on and so forth and then it gets into our food web which is dangerous for both humans and animals. It is unclear exactly what is going to happen with this information but I guess it's good to have the whole picture in order to make the best most educated decisions. At number four we have urethenes plasticus. As we learned earlier the Mariana Trench has not gone untouched by plastics. Well back in 2014 scientists discovered a new species at 6900 meters below and the tiny crustacean was found to already have ingested some of Earth's plastic. Therefore, they gave it the name Urethenes plasticus. With the support of the World Wildlife Foundation in analyzing the newly discovered species, scientists found a 6.5 millimeter large piece of large microfiber made up of 80% PET in its body. PET is a substance found in a variety of commonly used household items such as water bottles and workout clothes. Now it's also found in deep sea wildlife, so much that we're naming deep sea creatures after plastics. This one is alarming because in the deepest parts of our planet that we know the least about, even less than space, we're still finding humans making their mark before humans even get there themselves. <laughs> Yikes. Let's hope we don't have to start naming species uh, Rubberus Americanus or even Coca Cola Soft Drinkus. Hmm? In our number three spot today, we have ocean sediment. Okay. There's sediment in all of our oceans, so this one definitely doesn't seem like it should be on this list, but the Mariana Trench sediment is unique because of its extreme depth. While there are of course large fish who eat other fish, what do the small fish and living creatures who don't eat other fish eat? Since there's no plants, that is why researchers collected samples of the sediment that lays on the floor of the Mariana Trench, to see what it is made out of, to see what the heck these guys are eating. As it turns out, if the organisms aren't eating chemicals, 
they're eating the leftovers from the fish that live closer to the surface of the ocean. These leftovers float down to the deepest, darkest parts of the ocean, which is referred to as sea snow, and that is what becomes the meal for the smallest creatures living in the trench. Kind of gross when you think about it, but I'm happy for them. Coming in at number two, we have scalding hot water. That's right, just like Katy Perry, the Marianas Trench is hot and cold. At the deepest spot on Earth where basically no sunlight can get through, you would expect that the water was extremely cold, right? Wrong. Well, okay, maybe kind of right. The water usually stays between 34 to 39 degrees Fahrenheit, but also wrong. The water at the bottom of the Mariana Trench can also get scalding hot. At the bottom of the Mariana Trench, there are many different hydrothermal vents and the water that erupts out of these vents can reach temperatures of 700 degrees Fahrenheit, which is enough to scald anyone swimming down there. But fortunately, the pressure is way too high for anyone to actually swim down there, so that won't be happening anytime soon. That being said, for those that decide to dive deep, 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 deep down there, make sure that the deep sea sub you're in is not only pressurized, but also has an AC, because you don't want to cook like a boiled lobster. In our number one spot today, we have giant amphipods. I will never not be fascinated by these things, so here we are again with more giant amphipod facts. Amphipods are little crustaceans that can be found in most waters on Earth, and they're kind of like shrimp. The Mariana Trench variety are absolutely shocking compared to the amphipods we are used to, and that is because they are like the Shaquille O'Neal of shrimps. They're huge! These guys can be found 35,797 feet or 10,911 meters deep in the trench, and while most amphipods are like two to three centimeters, centimeters or about an inch long. These guys are a whopping 34 centimeters or just over 13 inches long. Like what? A scientist explained that the discovery is a bit like finding a foot long cockroach. And I have to say that the surprise may be the same, but I would rather find a huge shrimp than a huge cockroach any day. Before the discovery of these guys, researchers didn't even know that amphipods could grow this large, so it's safe to say that they certainly were not expecting this discovery. Starting us off at number 10 is the barrel eye fish. Now this fish isn't that creepy looking, I will admit, but it is a little gross and futuristic looking. Why? Because you can see directly inside its head. Since the Mariana Trench is so deep and dark, how the heck is a fish going to see where it's going or what's around them? Answer: They're going to make their own light. The barrel eye fish has a transparent head with two barrel like eyes inside of its head that face upwards. This lets the fish see the silhouettes of its prey. How convenient. Scientists believe that its transparent head allows for the barrel eye fish to collect just a bit more light which gives this fish just a bit bit more of an advantage over its deep water competition. The barrel eye fish wasn't even known to humans until 1939, when one was pulled from its underwater home at 2,500 feet below the surface. Although they can't survive past a certain point, as they are too used to the deep underwater pressure. Luckily, scientists now have high-tech underwater rovers that they can use to go learn more about the reproduction and life cycles of these strange fish. At number nine, we have the deep sea dragonfish. Any fish with the name dragon in it is sure to be a sight for sore eyes, literally. This fish has humongous teeth, a pretty ugly face (hashtag sorry not sorry) and is is known to be a deep underwater assassin. These fish are 6 inches or 15 centimeters long and live at the depths of 6 to 7,000 feet. Like many of these deep water creatures, the dragonfish also has the highly sought after bioluminescent feature. Beneath its chin dangles a lighted barbell that is used to communicate with other fish as well as is used for camouflage when need be. Other fish mistaken the light bulb for another smaller fish or even prey of its own, only to be surprised that itself is the prey and that it's way too late. Chomp! Some dragonfish even have gained the ability to glow Red. Some believe that the red glow is used to signal its deep water brethren, while others believe it to be a signal of the dragonfish about to pounce. Either way, a glowing red fish sounds terrifying to me, no matter how big or small, so I'ma stay in the shallow end. At number eight, we have the deep sea hatchet fish. Why is it called a hatchet fish? Well, imagine if that hatchet in your garage had fins, eyes, gills, and could swim freely around the ocean. Then it would pretty much look like this guy. Or one of these guys, because believe it or not, there are over 40 different species of hatchet fish out there, and I'm sure there is more somewhere. These fish are the same size as the dragonfish, so they aren't that big, but they can be found at depths of 5,000 feet. Be careful though. These guys are also sneaky because they have that highly sought after bioluminescent feature and can camouflage themselves from predators quite easily as well. I mean, we won't see them often because of the depths that they live at, but that's okay. I'm not complaining. I like seeing the hatchet stay where it belongs. In my garage, safely kept away from the water and only taken out when having backyard campfires. And man oh man, does that sound good right now. Coming in at number seven, we have comb jellies. They have a much more scientific name, but I think comb jellies is much more fun, and if you really care about the scientific name, I'll let you take a stab at it on your 
drone. Anyway, these crazy light up alien like fish can come in sizes from a few inches all the way up to five feet. Luckily, like their other jelly man cousin, the actual jellyfish, these guys don't have any stingers. But they will attack their own sometimes, so watch out for those underwater MMA matches between these guys. They swim through the ocean by swaying their comb teeth like tentacles on the side of their body, and they are another sight for sore eyes, really. Just recently, the New York Times found a new way to continue researching these creatures by taking samples of their DNA from a process that is called environmental DNA sampling, where scientists collect snippets of DNA from fallen hair, skin, and mucus that the creatures shed into their environment underwater. It is said that the 200 known species could rise to 6 to almost 800 using this new system. I kind of would love some more, but can't deny that these creatures look totally out of this world. So, props to the jellymans. At number 6, we have the sea devil anglerfish. So, if a fish has the name dragon or devil in its name, you know it's one to probably look out for. Found deep in the Mariana Trench, probably from swimming up from hell, is the sea devil anglerfish. It has a crazy misshapen body, sorry to body shame, the razor like teeth and fins, and teeth and eyes that can disappear just like that. Yeah, sounds like some demonic powers to me. Likely for everyone on the planet, these fish aren't that big. Females are larger, and the biggest they can grow to be is 8 inches long, while males are only about 2 inches. It also has a bioluminescent bulb on top of its head that lures in prey before it even has a second to swim away. Now, does this sound familiar? Yeah, it should, because if you ever watched Finding Nemo, then this is the fish that Marlin and Dory almost got eaten by. So, if you happen to be a superhuman and can swim at great depths to see these scary fish, in the words of Dory, just keep swimming. Coming in at our halfway point at number 5, we have the frilled shark. Remember the puffy shirt from Seinfeld with all of the frills? Well, Jerry looked pretty terrible in it, and this shark looks terrifying in it. Well, with them, not in it, because let's face it, the shark isn't wearing a shirt, but either way, I'm sure it could still make the shirt look cooler than Jerry Seinfeld. Anyway, this shark has the body of an eel with the head of probably one of the scariest creatures on earth. It has six frilly gills on the side of its head, to no one's surprise, and can measure up to six feet in length. That's longer than me. It also has 20 rows of razor sharp trident shaped teeth that will tear right through any flesh it can sink its teeth into. They usually live in waters around 4,000 feet deep, and the odd time humans catch one and bring them to the surface, but please don't do this. One, because don't go near these crazy things, and two, because these creatures can't handle life above as they are used to the great underwater pressure. Any brought to the surface will almost die immediately. So remember, frilled sharks are friends, not food. Okay, 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 we have had dragon and demon in the names of some of our underwater creatures today. Can you guess one more that we might have enough said? No? Well, how about goblin? That's right, coming in at number 4, we have the frilled shark's trusty companion, the goblin shark. If you get one look at these things, you will understand exactly why these things are called goblin sharks. They have a large protruding snout, then underneath that is a protruding jaw of razor sharp teeth. Honestly, once again, to put it simply, these guys are just straight up ugly and scary. They also aren't the normal grey color that most sharks are. They are instead colored with a pinkish hue. In case these guys aren't scary enough, you will be happy to know that these things grow to be 18 feet in length. But you probably won't ever see one as they live at depths of 3,000 feet and go deeper the older they get. Other than that, there is not much known about these creatures because of how deep they live, but also because of how freaking scary they are. Yeah. Dewey ain't going anywhere near that thing. Starting us off in our top 3, at number 3 is the Dumbo Octopus. I know, I know, the thing doesn't sound or seem that scary. After all, it's named after a freaking Disney cartoon, I get it. But these crazy looking things are known to eat its prey whole. They only grow to be about a foot in length, but if they can swallow its prey whole, I don't want to imagine how big its prey can be. Because maybe they even eat like snakes, who knows? Anyway, these guys live at depths of 9800 to 13,000 feet and are actually the deepest dwelling octopus known to science. That's pretty cool. So while these guys actually look kind of cute, I'm sure they are quite the scare for some deep water fish, as well as who knows if they evolved to have larger cousins at the very bottom of the sea. Who knows? Yeah, I don't. At our number 2 spot, we have the cousin of Dumbo, the telescope octopus. These things are so weird and also have a completely transparent body. Well, almost, so I guess that makes it more translucent, but I don't know. Anyway, these weird looking octopi live at depths of 6,500 feet and they don't swim horizontally either. They actually just float vertically, making it harder for deep sea predators to spot it. It also has webbing between its tentacles, giving it a ghostly like shape. And one last thing that makes it kind of creepy is that these creatures have wicked eyes. In its head are two protruding eyeballs that can fully rotate and keep an eye out for its deep water predators. What kind of predators? Well, let's check out our number one spot. And finally, coming in at number one, one spot is sea monsters. Ah, okay. Have sea monsters actually been found in the deep waters of the Marianas Trench? No, but could there be? Absolutely. I know I have gone on and on about how little our oceans have been explored, but one of those specific places in our oceans is the Marianas Trench. It is so deep that no human on Earth can reach its depths fully, and even if they did, they would need an incredibly powerful pressurized submarine. So who the heck knows what else is swimming around at the bottom of our oceans? I mean, they said the giant squid was a legend, and it turned out to be real. So anything goes, really. Let's just hope we find 
find footage of a monster first and not find out the hard way, you know, by <laughs> being lunch. Starting us off at number 10, we have sweet wrappers. Some of you might be confused and not know what that is. And if you are one of those people, they are more commonly known as candy wrappers or trash or even rubbish or even garbage. I think you get it now. Anyway, along with that other plastic bag that we talked about in the first video, candy wrappers and tons of other human garbage were found in the depths of the Marianas Trench. The deepest spot on Earth is still not untouched by humans. This is a sad discovery that scientists were not thrilled about, but it was also a huge wake up call too. So let's continue to be careful with our trash and where we put it. The plastic bag was one thing, but when I found out that that was just the beginning of the human trash that they found down there, that was a little upsetting. So stop eating sweets and candy. I'm, I'm just kidding, I, I know we pretty much can't do that, but just be careful where we put our garbage. In our number nine spot today, we have sea pigs. These guys are a genus of sea cucumber, but they have these little tube-like legs, which is why they look super weird. Not that regular sea cucumbers look exceptionally normal, but these ones look even weirder than the regular ones. They like to live on the seafloor where they move through the sediment searching for their next meal. They eat by extracting tiny little particles of organic matter that have fallen from closer to the surface of the ocean down to the mud on the seafloor. They're like the best little Roombas. Sea pigs tend to measure somewhere around 15 centimeters or 4 to 6 inches long and they live at a depth of somewhere between 1,200 to 5,000 meters deep in the sea. These guys have their own special little defense mechanism and that is how their skin carries a natural poison which would make them a less than ideal meal for their predators. It is quite imperative that these guys stay in their deep sea habitat because they are specifically built for that and when brought up closer to the surface they disintegrate. Coming in at our number 8 spot we have robots. Say what? Are the AIs finally taking over? Are aliens actually just ancient robots like the Autobots and Decepticons? What is going on down there? Well, none of those that we know of. But the reason why we have been able to search and discover new areas of our oceans at such great depths is because scientists and researchers have started using robots, or more commonly known as rovers down at the bottom of the ocean. Just like the rovers we use on the moon and Mars, these underwater rovers can go where humans cannot, as well as retrieve materials that we would never be able to retrieve by ourselves. So as nervous as I am about the robots taking over, I have to tip my hat to them in this regard. So, thanks, Robo Dudes. In our number seven spot today, we have the Hydro Medusa. This fancy pants jellyfish came as quite a surprise during a robotic exploration of the Mariana Trench in 2016. What at first looked like some sort of alien spacecraft turned out to be a new, unidentified species of jellyfish. At a first sight, this jelly had its tentacles splayed out as if it was ready to catch some prey. Apparently, the tentacles act as a sort of netting to ensnare and then subdue their potential prey, but this jelly quickly calmed down and continued floating on by. This guy was found near the Enigma Seamount at a depth of 3,700 meters. The really interesting thing about this jelly is in its bell. While the bell itself is translucent, inside are glowing red and yellow bulbs of light. The glowing bulbs of light really do give it an otherworldly appearance and it is simply amazing to look at. At number six, we have a retired US Navy officer. Yeah, you heard me. Victor Vescovo is a retired US Navy officer and is one of the 70 people on Earth who have earned the Explorer's Grand Slam title. After Vescovo retired from the Navy, he became a private equity investor with a humongous interest in exploring the wildest places on Earth. He has completed the seven summits exploring the highest points on Earth from each continent and most recently completed the Five Deeps expedition, where he visited the five deepest points on Earth, one of them being, of course, the Marianas Trench. In 2019, in the expedition known as the Challenger Deep. Vescovo and his team visited the deepest point on Earth during that expedition at 11 kilometers below the ocean's surface and earned Guinness World Records for their explorations. Vescovo helped fund to hire the amazing team he had on board as well as to build the latest high-tech submarine to reach such depths. They were at an area of ocean that is 1,000 times the pressure of the surface. Big ouch. So if you want to get deep, I suggest you take Victor Vescovo with you. Coming in at number five at our halfway mark, we have comb jellies. Comb jellies are one of the most beautiful creatures I've ever seen in my life and that is mostly due to their combs. The combs I'm talking about are actually plates of fused cilia which help these jellies propel themselves through the deep waters of the Mariana Trench like their own little boat oars. There are other creatures who also have combs but these jellies are the largest creatures with them. Why these jellies are so beautiful is because the combs create a sort of rainbow effect because of the light being scattered in different directions because the cilia are moving. Comb jellies only have one pair of tentacles but Sometimes it appears to be more, but that is because their tentacles can branch out. These jellies don't sting and instead their tentacles are used as a sort of fishing line to help them catch their prey. 
Coming in at number four is James Cameron. Wait, hold on a sec. Olivia, did I just say Academy Award winning director James Cameron was found at the bottom of the Marianas Trench? You did! I did! Yes, I did. <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> oh my god, hashtag fire Dewey. <laughs> Along with making one of his most famous movies ever about an old boat, it was also his lifelong dream of exploring the depths of the Marianas Trench. This guy just can't get enough of the underwater life, and honestly, I can't blame him because it looks super cool. Anyway, back in 2012, Cameron with the team of scientists visited the trench at a depth of 11 kilometers as well. Wait, isn't that the exact same depth as Victor Vescovo? Yeah, kind of. Vescovo was able to reach just a bit further than Cameron, so this time the Oscar goes to Victor. Sorry, Jimbo. But Cameron also helped design a 24 underwater submersible sub called the Deep Sea Challenger in the shape of Titanic. <laughs> just kidding, that would be insensitive. The windows on the sub were nine and a half inches thick, so they could withstand the immense pressure. While down there, they discovered 68 new species, mostly of bacteria, but also also a couple invertebrates as well. So there you go. James Cameron is just not a one trick pony. In our number three spot today, we have the Barrel Eye. I can talk about creatures that look otherworldly all day, and while the Mariana Trench is full of them, the Barrel Eye is definitely nearing the top of that list. These guys are also known as spookfish, and they have these large, protruding, telescopic eyes that are enclosed in a transparent dome of soft tissue. That was a long way of saying they have a see through head, and it is so weird to look at. These guys can't be taken out of their deep sea environment because they are unable to withstand the change in pressure, so for a while after their initial discovery, the only way people who had seen them in the deep sea could show anyone else what they looked like was through drawings. Imagine trying to tell someone that you found a fish with a see through head, but you have no evidence to prove it. These guys are usually found motionless, just kind of floating in one spot as they don't tend to move around a bunch at a depth of around 600 to 800 meters in the ocean. Coming in at our number two spot is the unknown. There is still plenty of unknown left in the Marianas Trench. Countless people have now explored down there, but the water is just above freezing and it is extremely dark and the pressure is an immense eight tons per square inch. Holy burst eardrums, Batman. With all the tech that we have today, we are still doing all that we can to find new ways of exploring the ocean depths for longer and with more visibility. It's hard to say just how much we have really uncovered when we can only go down there for so long and with just our little rovers, subs, flashlights, and Hollywood directors. Either way, I I can't wait to see where scientists take us on this next one and who knows, maybe one day I will get my confirmed sea monster that I've been waiting for my entire freaking life. In our number one spot today, we have the predatory tunicate. The predatory tunicate is like the Venus flytrap of the deep sea. These guys are one of the most unique creatures I've ever learned about personally because I don't know any other animal that is like them. They start out life kind of like tadpoles and then they swim until they find their perfect spot either along a canyon wall or on the sea floor. Once they've found their spot, they plant themselves in place using a natural adhesive that they produce. Once planted, they will undergo a huge change and this is where they will stay for the rest of their lives. They're super picky about where exactly they make their homes because it will be where they stay and because they need to make sure that both the chemicals in the water in that area as well as the temperature of the water is just right. Like the three little bears of the deep sea. Unfortunately, if these guys get moved from the location they choose to make their home, they will die, so it is imperative that they are left alone. They basically wait for food to drift on by and, like a Venus flytrap, when they get their meal, their mouths will snap shut until they're done digesting. The predatory tunicate is a point of study in the medical world because they actually have been known to help with some more serious medical conditions, which is always an incredible thing. Number 10, the frilled shark. This is one of the most stealthiest sharks in the See, this shark is so stealthy that researchers believe that it had been extinct for 80 million years. Little did they know, it's just very good at hiding. The frill shark is a deep sea dwelling creature that was rediscovered in 2015 when two Australian fishermen caught it in their net. Frilled sharks kind of look like an eel, a shark, and a hairbrush kind of had a baby. It has a long slender body that slithers through the water in a very serpenty way. It earns its name due to the six gills it has on either side that fan out in an unusual way. But the really scary part is how many teeth they have. They have over 300 mini daggers in their mouth angled backwards like hooks so they latch onto their prey like Velcro. It is one of the few creatures on earth to be considered a living fossil because it happens to be the only one of its kind. It has no other relatives, which if you're someone who doesn't like their in-laws, not really a bad thing, I guess. 
Number 9, Massive Amphipods. If you love jumbo shrimp, then oh boy, this would be a treat. Massive amphipods have been found in the trench. They kind of look like massive shrimp, which is a direct result of a phenomenon called giantism. The massive crustaceans can grow to over a foot long in the Challenger Deep, while the ones closest to the surface only reach about 3 centimeters. The reason they have gotten so large is a part of their strategy to help them survive the immense pressure of being a deep sea survivor. A group of molecules called a pie Isolite were found and they help stabilize proteins against hydrostatic pressure. This helps them survive and could have a hand in helping them grow to be so large. Number 8 Glass Amoebas In order to live that far down into the ocean, there are going to be three main things that you'll have to overcome. Lack of light, freezing temperatures, and a lot of pressure. Therefore, intense survival skills are required. Scientists were shocked to find Foraminifera, a kind of amoeba, surviving down in Mariana's Trench, but with some alterations. This kind of organism is found all over the world, but usually they build hard shells for themselves out of calcium carbonate. Down in the trench, the intense pressures dissolve these minerals, leading them to instead build a kind of glass house. They have adapted to use proteins, organic polymers, and even sand, which is made from silicon dioxide. Oxide, which forms a kind of pressure proof glass shell. A specific kind of foraminifera called xenophyphores have taken this one step further and glue sand, casts of shells and microbial skeletons to their feces, which essentially makes a pressure proof shell to live in. Gotta do what you gotta poo, I mean do. Number 7, the barrel eye fish. This fish looks like Pixar teamed up with Tim Burton and made this fish up. It looks like an animation floating in the water. Nothing makes sense. Someone once said to me that if you've thought about it, chances are someone's done it or that it exists. I imagine that's untrue for most things, but I've definitely thought about what it could be like to have a see through body, and this fish brought that thought to life, so who knows. The bear life fish has a head that is entirely see through. It was originally presumed that they only had a tunnel vision because any specimens collected would die before they reached the surface and their head would collapse. But now, scientists are able to confirm that they actually actually rotate their eyes to look up through a fluid filled shield, which is their head, to check out prey above them. They also have fins specifically adapted to allow the creature to hover frozen in place. Their eyes are also designed to capture light just enough to see silhouettes of their prey. So they have really, really incredible eyes. Weird. They look so pretty though. I like them. Number six, benthocodone. The thing that fascinates me the most about the creatures in the Mariana Trench is their size and appearance. Why? The water pressure at the bottom of the trench is about eight tons per square inch, about 60,000 pounds per square inch. You'd think to be able to stand that pressure, you'd have to be like Godzilla or something. But that's not the case. It's close to the exact opposite. The benthocodone is a deep sea jelly that is entirely opaque and floats around in a deep red hue. Pretty delicate and really small. The opaque bell serves as a way of hiding its food in case their bioluminescent lunch signals other predators. It has over 1500 tentacles and despite its little size and delicate flesh, it can survive the immense pressure of the deep. So figure that one out. Number 5, the stout black smelt. This deep sea dweller has also been dubbed the owlfish due to its eyes. In comparison to its body, its eyes are like pretty massive, and we can guess why. The stout black smelt uses its massive eyes to help capture any light it can lay its eyes on. The eyes have cones in them, have like narrow cones that help them suck in as much light as possible, kind of like a vacuum for light. It is a feature they definitely need while they continue to live at depths of over 6,600 meters. Not too much else is known about this little guy, save for the fact it definitely can't stand against a squid. <laughs> Here's a video of this poor fish losing a battle with a squid. Check it out. Owlfish are predators that feed on small crustaceans and jellies. They have enormous eyes to help them find their food in the dim light at great depths. Number four, the anglerfish, slash the nope fish. This is the most terrifyingly ugly fish in the world. There are over 200 species of anglerfish that dominate the midnight zone with their terrifying good looks. Each are similar dark brown and gray in color with massive heads and mouths decorated in sharp translucent teeth. The largest species can reach up to 3.3 feet in length or significantly smaller, less than a foot. They they are the horror movie villain of the deep with tricky bioluminescent lures. Thanks to these horrifying creatures, Finding Nemo almost had a grimmer ending. Despite their size, the mouth of the anglerfish is massive and like a python, 
can stretch wide enough to consume prey twice their size. Considering there's absolutely no light, it's cold and lonely, I guess it makes sense that they are a little angry. One can't afford to make friends out of fish when their next meal could be days away, so. Fish aren't friends, they are food. Number three, Dumbo octopus. Mm, I love it so much. Weird cute is the best combination, okay? Fight me, I'll just show you a picture of this. Meet the only cute thing to live in such a dark place, the Dumbo octopus. The Dumbo octopus, as you can guess, resembles Disney's adorable Dumbo elephant, as it has big fins that look like ears on either side of its head and just like, whoop, flings around. These fins help this floating booby boop steer through currents. They try so hard. While they vary in color and size, they usually reach around 20 to 30 centimeters, so they're really small. While some have also been found to almost reach six feet, so that's like one you could hug. Sadly, you won't come across them in shallow water as these cute water babies are only found around 400 to 4800 meters below the surface. Since where they live is so dark, they don't need an ink sac to defend themselves, so they don't have one. But honestly, who would want to attack this little guy? Look at those eyes. Puss in Boots can take a seat. Number two, the tripod fish. Can we talk about how this fish looks like they are an alien standing on the moon? Kinda, sorta, yeah? Anyways, yes, that fish is literally standing on the sand. The tripod fish is yet another fish that has adapted in a strange way to live in the deepest, darkest depths of over 6,000 meters. Another tiny but mighty example, it can only grow to about three centimeters long, while its long, bony fins can extend to a meter, allowing it to stand. Researchers estimate that fluid is pumped into them, which allows them to become rigid so they can actually prop themselves up. If you're wondering why they want to be taller, Ask yourself that question the next time you purchase a pair of heels. By standing tall, it's got the best vantage point to capture prey, such as small crustaceans. As they float in the current, the tripod fish can just open their mouths and catch them like snowflakes. However, it is practically blind due to its habitat, so its fins sense vibrations to anticipate predators. So otherwise it just kind of waits there for food. Number one, last but not least, the Mariana snailfish. Though it doesn't look like it could withstand pressures of a thousand feet below, the Mariana snailfish proves yet again the age old phrase of never judge a book by its cover. Meet the deepest fish in the ocean which thrives at 8,000 feet below sea level. Though they look small, fragile, and slightly translucent, these little guys are actually the top predator at this depth. With few predators, they get the cream of the crop when it comes to food down there. They kind of look like white fat goldfish with a long narrow tail. Its flesh is so translucent you can even see its liver through the skin. Compared to some of the other creatures on this list, it definitely doesn't scream robust survivor, but has adapted in a new clever way scientists are still trying to understand. Starting us off at number 10, the Sedlec Ossuary. From the outside, this church wouldn't really make anyone bat an eye. Located in the Czech Republic, it appears to be a run of the mill gothic church. But on the inside, well, that's a whole Whole different story. Nicknamed the Church of Bones, this church is quite literally lore to ceiling skeletons down to the chandelier and everything. This whole thing started back in 1278 when the King of Bohemia sent the abbot of the Sedlec Monastery to Jerusalem. When the abbot returned from his trip, he brought back holy soil and soon everyone from miles away wanted to be buried in Sedlec and so they needed to expand their cemetery. In the 15th century, the church was built and they used the basement to house the access bones. Those bones stayed there for centuries until a wood carver named Frantisek Rint was appointed to arrange them in 1870, which is what you see if you walk into the church today. Now, while people may have given up themselves willingly, that doesn't mean their spirits haunt it any less. And with that many bones in one place, I'm sure there are some evil ones in the crowd just waiting for an opportunity to torture the right person. Next up at number nine, Chuck Lagoon. Lagoon. Formerly known as Truck Lagoon, this haunted graveyard is located in Micronesia, 50 feet underwater, but it hasn't always been that way. Once upon a time, it was actually a base for the Japanese Navy in World War II that was heavily fortified with Imperial battleships, aircraft carriers, cruisers, destroyers, minesweepers, and submarines. But of course, this posed a huge threat to the Allies. So in 1944, over three days, the American Navy
Navy attacked the base, sinking hundreds of their planes and warships. Sometimes referred to as the ghost fleet of the Truck Lagoon, the remains of the lost ships remain today, and divers that visit say there is something that is just not right about the area. Inside the ship graveyards lie preserved gas masks, piles of bones, medicines, and even creepy operating tables. Some even say they've witnessed ghosts lurking around the ships and got so scared that they fled to the surface, fearing they might get trapped in the ship forever. Coming in at number 8, Airedale Asylum. Located in Victoria, Australia, this asylum opened back in 1867. It consisted of 60 different buildings and was almost like a small village containing orchards, markets, and vineyards. As with many institutions of the time, it was built to be self-efficient, providing the patients with labor that was believed to help with their treatments. But sadly, during its 130 years in operation, over 13,000 patients and staff died at the asylum, and many claim to have witnessed dozens of different ghosts over the years. Those that have been to the building today report feeling nausea, lightheadedness, and random pains all over their body, while others say they've literally seen the ghosts of patients roaming the halls. One ghost in particular called Nurse Carrie is known to roam the women's ward and some say they've seen her walk through walls. Others claim that when they went into a room used for shock therapy, they began feeling tingling in their heads, and if you dare enter the cursed J ward, you might even get bit. Coming in at number 7, Miyakajima. Located a 180 kilometers south of Tokyo is the island of Miyakajima. And although it's not haunted by some terrifying entity, it still might just be one of the last places I would want to visit. The island is the host to Mount Oyama, an active volcano, and is itself a straddle volcano, which, as far as volcanoes go, are just about the most dangerous and unpredictable you can get. Their last major eruption in 2000 required a complete evacuation of the island. But it's not just the chance that the volcano could erupt at any given moment, it's also that it emits poisonous sulfuric gas, pretty much no warning at all. So all 3,000 residents, as well as anyone who visits the island, is required to carry a gas mask with them at all times, otherwise you could literally die. And if the fatal poisonous gas, mandatory gas mask, and potential volcano eruption didn't deter you, I will mention that it's located in the Dragon's Triangle, which is essentially the Pacific equivalent to the Bermuda Triangle, and there has been more than one report of vessels mysteriously disappearing while trying to cross. Next up at number 6, Paris Catacombs. In 18th century Paris, cemeteries were at a near hopeless state. I mean, you could barely walk through town without smelling the rotting dead bodies, and they were quickly running out of places to put them all. So when King Louis XVI came into power, he enlisted his architect to build a system of underground catacombs to transfer all the bodies to. It allegedly took 12 years to transfer all the bodies which is no surprise considering the remains of more than 6 million people can be found there. And as you've probably guessed, it's wicked haunted. And although many have dared to visit these winding maze tunnels, that doesn't mean it comes without risk. Visitors say they've seen strange orbs of light, taunting voices, and indescribable shadows lurking in the tunnel, while others say they've literally seen ghosts. But the biggest reason to fear the tunnels is because many that enter never return. Coming in at number Number 5, Borley Rectory. Built in 1862 by Reverend Henry Dawson Bull, the residents of Essex today consider this to be the most haunted house in all of England. But even before it was Reverend Bull's family home, it already came with a haunting reputation. Previously, a monk and a nun who lived in nearby buildings had fallen in love. The secret couple would sneak out at night to see each other as they knew they could never show their true feelings in public. One day, they decided they were going to run away together and elope. But on their way out of town, they were caught. The monk was hanged and the nun was imprisoned in the basement of the convent until she eventually died. Years later, when the Bull family moved in, it didn't take too long before they started to notice something was wrong. Even though the building was new, the grounds beneath it housed the tortured spirits, and they did not make themselves strangers to the family. They'd report hearing running water inside, despite there being no indoor plumbing in the house. 
house. One of the daughters was especially haunted by the nun and said she was slapped on her cheek and had a red mark to prove it. Maybe the monk and nun were just jealous to see someone else living the life they yearn for or maybe an even darker spirit is haunting its halls. Coming in at number 4, Screaming Tunnel. Located in Niagara Falls, Ontario, this tunnel lies underneath a railway track and was originally constructed as a drainage tunnel for the nearby farmland. But nowadays it's more well known for the ghost who haunts it and the soul crushing story of how she got trapped. As the legend goes, a few hundred years ago a girl lived in a nearby farmhouse with her mother and father. Her father was an alcoholic and a very violent man who hurt her and her mother frequently. One day the mother said enough is enough. She told him she was leaving and taking the girl with her. But the father in a drunken rage screamed at the mother and knocked her unconscious. The girl afraid for her life ran as fast as she could and decided to hide in the nearby tunnel until things cooled off. Only moments later she heard her father approaching and next thing she knew he was dousing her in some kind of liquid but it was too dark to tell what. As the father left the tunnel he threw a match and that girl died screaming so loudly that the whole town could hear. Ever since anyone who enters the tunnel with a lit match sees the spirit of the girl for only a moment before the fire dies out and she screams so loud that you feel like your ears just might burst. Next up at number 3, Paveglia Island. It might be a small gorgeous dot of land in the Venice lagoon but this island is far from a picture perfect Italian destination. After already losing roughly half of the Venetian population to the Black Death in 1347, by the 1400s the people of Venice discovered the concept of quarantine and felt they'd hit a gold mine. So by the time the subsequent outbreaks occurred they started sending over anyone with even the mildest symptom with even the mildest symptoms to nearby islands, most famously Paveglia Island. The infected populace was forced to remain quarantined on the island for 40 days, but without any actual cure available, pretty much everyone still died and so it became a mass gravesite, incinerating most of the dead bodies so as not to let the disease spread. Then in the 20th century it became a mental institution and its reputation only got worse. Allegedly the experiments performed on the patients were so unethical and so cruel that the doctor responsible took his life to try and escape the crimes he had caused. But others think he was tormented by the thousands of ghosts already haunting the island and ended his life to escape their torments. Either way it's riddled with terrifying spirits and the last place you should visit if you plan on going to Italy. Coming in at number 2, Highgate Cemetery. One of the magnificent seven cemeteries outside London, and I'm not kidding that is the real name of them, Highgate was established in 1839 during a time when church cemeteries started becoming overwhelmed by the amount of burials required. To date roughly 170,000 people have been laid to rest on its grounds and despite that incredible number it's not the many laid to rest here that you need to fear but one 7 foot tall phantom who locals call the Highgate Vampire. The rumors began in the early 1960s when two teenagers claimed to see the dead rising from their graves as they walked down through the cemetery late one night. Soon others started coming forward saying they saw a horrid black figure with red eyes lurking behind the gates. Next thing you know authorities were getting hundreds of reports all claiming to see a dark shadowy figure in the night. But it all started to be taken seriously once police started finding animal carcasses drained of their blood around the cemetery grounds. Soon the story was sensationalized by the press and residents and a manhunt to kill the vampire was organized. Graves were vandalized and some corpses even beheaded in hopes it would stop the phantom from haunting the premises. And last up in our number one spot, Island of Dolls. I don't know about you guys, but I have always got bad vibes from dolls. Like there is just something about them that I don't trust and it's not just because of Chucky, although I'm sure that movie didn't help. Located in Mexico, this island has a reputation for being one of the most haunted places in the world. Legend has it that a girl died drowning here and when a man named Julian Barrera moved to the island he was tormented by the girl's spirit. In an attempt to please her he began hanging dolls across the island, but it seems the dolls weren't 
enough to please the spirit as later Julian convinced his nephew that she needed a friend to join her in the afterlife. The nephew's body was later found in the canal at the very same spot where the girl died years prior. Those who dare visit the island today feel as if the dolls are alive and report that their eyes move and watch them as they walk across it. Some claim it's not just their eyes but also their hands that move and that the dolls will laugh and whisper behind your back as you walk past. To summarize, it's a no for me. <laughs> Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have comb jellies. Comb jellies are gelatinous creatures that are named for their unique plates of fused cilia, which are called combs. These combs help the jellies move through the water like boat oars. And while other microscopic organisms also have this sort of mechanism, comb jellies are the largest animal with this feature. These combs are also part of the reason that comb jellies are so gorgeous to look at. Rather than bioluminescence, the rainbow light effect that can sometimes be seen on them is from light diffracting off of the combs in all different directions. Many comb jellies have one pair of tentacles, although they appear to have multiple, but that is just caused by their tentacles branching out. These tentacles are used to help them hunt like a sort of fishing line. Aside from this, these jellies don't sting, which is always a good thing. Not that I'm planning on heading into the deep sea anytime soon. In terms of today's list, I'd say that these guys are one of the less creepy creatures we've got going on. In our number nine spot today, we have the ping pong tree sponge. Doesn't this name sound so cute and sweet? Like something you'd want as like a little pet? Well, think again. These little things are not what their sweet name would suggest. The name of course comes from their appearance as they quite literally look like a little tree that's growing ping pong balls, but those little ping pong balls are where it all starts. The ping pongs have tiny little hook-like extensions that are there to trap any kind of prey that gets too close. From there, the sponge will slowly consume its prey while still alive. This may not be the most vicious creature in all of the deep sea, but it is proof that looks can be very deceiving. Would you have thought that this little thing would be a carnivorous creature? It honestly was a little surprising to me, personally. In our number eight spot today, we have the deep sea dragonfish. These guys are a pretty strong contender for strangest looking animal on this list. These predatory fish use their fang-like teeth to grab onto their prey in the dark, cold, deep sea environment. They have no scales and instead slippery eel-like skin which only adds to their creepiness level. Similar to the angler fish, these guys have a lighted barbel that hangs from its lower jaw to attract its prey towards it. These fish really use bioluminescence to their advantage, but they also have another less common ability. Firstly, since many of their prey are also bioluminescent, they have a special stomach that will ensure the light cannot be seen from the inside of their stomach so as to not give away their position. Secondly, they are able to produce a red glow. This glow is thought to perhaps be used to signal other dragonfish, but it is definitely used by them to illuminate and detect their prey. They are the only known fish that has the ability to both produce and see red light, as most fish can only see more of a blue light. So while these guys are definitely very creepy to look at, they're also pretty interesting and kinda talented. In our number 7 spot today, we have the zombie worm. These worms were first discovered in 2002 where they were living in the bones of the carcass of a dead whale nearly 10,000 feet or 3,000 meters deep in the ocean. The reason these guys have the common name zombie worm is because of the fact that their main food source is those same bones that they were first found living in. These guys love to eat bones, but in their own special way because of the fact that they don't have mouths or stomachs. Instead, they secrete an acid from their skin that dissolves the bones, which frees up the fat and proteins that are trapped inside. The worms then have their symbiotic bacteria that lives inside of them digest the fat and the protein. Here's the thing though, we actually don't know how the nutrients from the bacteria get to the worm. They either digest the bacteria somehow, or there is some sort of process where the nutrients get transferred. While when they were first found, they were chowing down on whale bones, zombie worms are happy to eat any kind of bones that they can come across, and they've actually been observed making a meal out of non-aquatic animal bones that somehow ended up in the deep sea. In our number 6 spot today, we have the barrel eye. This guy is one weird looking fish, man. The barrel eye fish is also known as the spook fish, and they of course 
most get their names due to their appearance. These fish are relatively small and they are best known for their extremely unusual transparent fluid filled heads. When these fish were first discovered, there were so many questions surrounding them. At first, scientists thought that their eyes were fixed in place, but after some further research, it was able to be determined that they are able to rotate both up and forward. The fish is usually found motionless, just hanging out in the depths of around 600 to 800 meters or 2,000 to 2,600 feet in the ocean. This fish has been known for quite some time with its first discovery coming in 1939, but it wasn't until 2004 that a photograph of a live one was ever captured for the world to see how unique these guys really are. There also used to be many drawings of these guys, but never with their transparent head because of the fact that it gets destroyed when the fish is brought up from the deep sea. So not that I think anyone is going to go diving in the Mariana Trench anytime soon, but if you do, don't bring these guys up from their home. They're happy down there with their heads fully intact. In our number five spot today, we have the ghost fish. This little ghost fish was caught on camera in 2016 as it was casually swimming along a ridge around 8,202 feet or 2,500 meters deep in the ocean. The fish is around 10 centimeters long and has translucent, scaleless skin and the creepiest, colorless eyes on any fish I've ever seen. Here's the craziest thing about this whole ordeal though. Though. This was the first time a live fish from its family has ever been seen before. This little fish swimming along, minding his own business, has absolutely no idea that he was a huge discovery for the human scientists on land. There is still so much that is left a mystery about these guys, but any kind of new discovery is most definitely always a step in the right direction. In our number four spot today, we have the aluminum plated amphipods. These guys are found not only in the Mariana Trench, but also in the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest part of the trench. Amphipods usually have shells made out of calcium carbonate, but the extreme environment in these guys' habitats make their shells basically just dissolve. They of course can't just be walking around naked and shellless, so what do they do? they adapt in order to preserve their shells. After collecting some of these guys from the deepest parts of the ocean, scientists were able to realize that their exoskeleton contained aluminum on the surface, which then led to the question, how did these guys find metal since it is pretty sparse in seawater? Well, as it turns out, these guys use sugar-based chemicals in their bellies to extract aluminum ions from the mud on the sea floor that it ends up ingesting while devouring the plant debris that floats down from the surface. In alkaline seawater, these aluminum ions form what is called aluminum hydroxide gel, which is a compound that we as humans use for like protecting our upset stomach from stomach acid. This gel then coats their shells and acts as a type of chemical protection so as to keep the calcium carbonate exoskeleton from dissolving. I don't know guys, I just think that's one of the coolest things that I've ever heard a shrimp do. This is the first known amphipod to do something like this, and these guys are now an important part of researching how maybe one day we can find an environmentally friendly way to produce aluminum. In our number three spot today, we have basket stars. Basket stars are like the Mariana Trench cousin of the starfish, and when you see them, you can totally understand why. These guys have the same main kind of disc that you see on a starfish, but rather than five stiff arms, these guys have five long, slender, flexible arms that all branch out from themselves repeatedly to form even more little tiny arms, with the last branch usually ending up curled. There there is no real rhyme or reason for the shapes of basket stars as it just depends on how they grow. So while some look beautiful and almost like a webbing of lace, there are some that look absolutely chaotic. You know what they say, no two basket stars are the same. I don't think anyone has ever said that, but we're gonna start. Basket stars are able to navigate around the seafloor by wiggling their arms around, and they also have the ability to curl into a ball when they're feeling threatened by predators. They also do eat as they have a mouth located on the underside of their their disc, and they prefer to eat things like krill, small crustaceans, and zooplankton. In our number two spot today, we have giant tube worms. These guys were totally unknown to scientists until the discovery of the hydrothermal vents because these giant tube worms live off of and thrive in these extreme areas. These giant tube worms feed off of the tiny bacteria that get their energy from the chemicals coming from the vent water. These giant tube worms grow to be around eight feet or over two meters and they have no mouth or digestive tract. Instead, they rely on those bacteria we talked about to live inside of them for their food, like a wonderful symbiotic relationship. These guys can best be spotted by their bright red 
plume, which is used for exchanging compounds with the seawater, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide. I could talk about these guys for forever because there's so many interesting facts about them, but I'll end off with just one more, and that is that the outer shell of these worms is made up of a natural substance called chitin, which is also the main component in the exoskeletons of crabs, lobsters, and shrimp. One more quickly, but I swear, it's the last one. These two worms also have no eyes, but they can sense movements and vibrations, and they will retreat into their protective tubes when they feel threatened. Okay. Now I'm actually done. In our number one spot today, we have the predatory tunicate, one of my favorite creatures to ever exist. They're so weird. These guys are basically like the Venus flytraps of the deep sea. These invertebrates make their home anchored along the deep sea canyon walls and seafloor as they wait for their meals to drift on by. Like the flytrap, when they catch a piece of their prey, their mouths will snap shut until they are finished digesting their meal. These guys start off life looking kind of like tadpoles and they swim around until they find a place to land, which they do upside down by secreting an adhesive to keep them in place. From here, they undergo a metamorphosis and have an incredibly large change. Despite having to worry about its predators, these guys are also very picky about where they live. They need to make sure the chemicals in the water as well as the temperature of the water are just right, and it's also imperative that they stay in place once they find their spot. If they're removed from the canyon wall, they unfortunately will die. The predatory tunicate may seem a little weird, but one cool thing is that they have been found to be useful in the medical world, and they may even have the potential to help with conditions such as melanoma and leukemia, which is absolutely incredible. 